Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. So, as we know, in the last three years, uh, quite unexpectedly, really, um, a number of uh, social movements have uh, exploded all over the world in reaction to political unaccountability, to economic crisis, in some cases to bloody dictatorships, in others um, in reaction to utter arrogance and disregard for people in the management of a major financial crisis, appropriating uh, the money and the votes from people without consulting and without relating to their wishes. We have seen increasingly, as often in history, in a moment in which there is major uh, issues, there are major issues that uh, shake people's life and no institutional capacity to manage the problems arising from these issues, then people take the matters into their hands. This has triggered a wave of social movements throughout the world. Starting, let's say, in Iceland in January 2009, and then intensifying uh, from December 2010 on in the Arab countries, uh, we have seen about at this point, uh, we can count uh, the, for, for the interval of the, all these years, uh, millions and millions of people. There's no statistic, but it's certainly over 10 million in the world with uh, similar kinds of movements in um, over over uh, 100 countries with uh, occupations of urban space in thousands of cities. People know about the, the, the usual suspects, the Spanish indignados, the uh, Occupy Wall Street, uh, Occupy London, and others. This point in Latin America is exploding all over. It's um, from Mexico's I am the uh, 132nd to the Chilean student movement, which in the last two years has been uh, fighting for the right to public education, the defense of public education. So what all these uh, movements uh, have in common is a number of trends. Certainly the motives and outcomes of the movements are very diverse. Um, as always in history, they, they have revolted for economic reasons, they have revolted for social reasons, rejecting the political arrogance of their elites, and in some cases, the, the dictatorships that were uh, clamping on them for uh, years and years. Um, but they all have one, one fundamental common element. They were movements, and they are movements for dignity. The claim for dignity comes from an emotional outburst in a non-tolerable situation. Mainly, any major social movement that I have uh, learned about in history, there are always emotional movements. There are emotional movements, movements that emerge on the basis of uh, oppression, uh, in the basis of misery, in, in the basis of exploitation. Uh, but at one point, all this um, suffering is expressed in some events that make people at large unable to control themselves any longer. The first way to understand the social movement is to identify the kind of events, the kind of elements that trigger these emotions. The most important emotion in that sense is um, anger. Anger which is expressed in, in, uh, as outrage in normal behavior. It's um, the one uh, element that triggers uh, the, the, the ability to overcome fear. Fear is a repressor of behavior. Anger is an accelerator of behavior. And fear is the most potent human emotion. In fact, most social order is based on fear. The way to overcome fear, it's a, a double one. First, there is a trigger, which is when anger is too strong. Second, there is the construction of a protective space uh, in which you are not alone with your fear. That's togetherness. 
This is where communication comes in powerfully. Most power relationships in society, in fact, are organized around the notion of controlling information and communication, particularly socialized communication, particularly communication that has the potential to reach society at large. And throughout history, information and communication control had been the key elements in control. As we know, power relationships come basically from two uh, sources, the, uh, the power, uh, the, the source of power being violence or intimidation, much better and, much better and company, but also through coercion and persuasion, not through coercion, but through persuasion, let's say the Bertrand Russell, Foucaultian, uh, Gramscian approach uh, to the analysis. So one of the two things. Personally, I contend that um, the um, persuasion and the shaping of the minds is the most important form of asserting power relationships. Because power that is based on violence or intimidation is relatively weak. Uh, because at one point, if people change, the, if a large number of people change the way they think, then it's a matter of time and of suffering. And sometimes a lot of suffering, blood and tears. But ultimately, there's no eternal power that is not based on some construction of, coercion, of persuasion capacities, or as Gramsci would put it in terms of hegemony. So that uh, is the, 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 back, the analytical background of what I had been observing, because exactly society, the interesting thing and the hopeful thing is that society is never simply a power structure shaping people's minds or coercing people. It's both. It's power and counterpower. Uh, if we would have one law in, in human nature, one, the first law, is wherever there is domination, there is resistance to domination. That's how, in fact, societies have evolved, fortunately. Sometimes the resistance to domination may yield to very undesirable consequences. So I'm not, I don't have this notion of the progress of humankind uh, toward enlightenment. Uh, sometimes it ends in the atomic bomb. Um, so uh, as I said, my, my host here, so it's a beautiful uh, hope that this is enlightenment and we all fight for that. And how humans are in every moment depends on the connection of their neural networks with each other and their neural networks uh, with nature and the neural networks with the communication networks that create the socialized communication. And therefore, the transformation of the organization and technology of communication is fundamental for the transformation of communication and therefore of the connection of humans among themselves and in relationship to uh, the society at large through communication networks. So that's why the internet is important. The public sphere has always been a public sphere of communication, institutional and non-institutional. And therefore, the transformation of these communication networks is uh, critical for the elaboration of new forms of social movements that challenge the, the powers that be, both in coercion and persuasion. Now, this um, challenge in our time is taking place through a social movement that always are based on uh, internet networks to start with and then develop in different forms. If we have similar patterns of all these social movements in very different cultural and institutional contexts, if we have similar features, then we can at least set the hypothesis that we are seeing a new form of social movement corresponding to a new form of social structure, the network society, and corresponding to new forms of cultural and institutional domination and counter-domination. As, let's say historically, the working class movement was created in the socialized production system of the large factories linked to bureaucratic organizations, to forties, to tailorists, etc., etc. So each society has its organizational forms, its communication forms, its technological forms, and therefore also is a specific forms of social change enacted by social movements. Social movements that I identify always as cultural movements, movements acting on the cultures and values of society, act, acting on the minds of people, different from political movements that act directly on the state. Of course, there is a direct relationship between the transformation of ideas, the transformation of culture, and the transformation of the state, or at least the reform of the state. So culture and politics cannot be separated by any means. Another feature is that these movements always are spontaneous in their origin. 
uh, in all these movements, as soon as they start, they are all the usual suspects of um, um, social mobilization. Trotskyite, Islamist, uh, whoever uh, was passing by. Uh, but they are simply, simply there because they are people motivated by justice, by, by the, the need to fight against the unjust social order, etc. But they are no one really initiates the movement. It's spontaneous. They are viral. They are viral. Uh, meaning, once they start, they diffuse viral in viral ways. Uh, virality, as you know, is one of the most important uh, characteristics of information in the internet age. And this virality goes from place to place, from one part of the world to another part of the world, and always relating to each other. We know the role played by Tunisia uh, being the, the example for the viral diffusion in the Arab Spring. But we also know that Iceland was absolutely critical in triggering other movements, particularly the Spanish movement. In, uh, so in that sense, the movements are both global and local. And sometimes they act together globally. On October 15, uh, 2011, took place one global demonstration against all kinds of issues um, uh, in which participated in 82 countries, at least about, it's calculated about 7 million people, uh, which were simply united by one call uh, in September over the internet on, on a slogan that could not be more simple, united for global change. Which global change? The one global change that each one locally would put into the global change. And no one organized that. It was a call. And everybody in every city started to, to do their own thing. For the moment, these social movements don't want to have leaders, don't want to have spokespersons, and those who try to be are um, cited by the movement. The majority of people are college educated, not young, by the way, average in, in the Spanish movement, 35 years old, so they are not kids. Uh, well, from my perspective, they are young, but, uh, <laughs> but this, this combination of relatively high education and low possibilities and expectations in society is, is an important one. They are never violent movements. They are inclu including, in fact, they are non-violent movements explicitly. Now, if you have tanks and machine guns and helicopters against you, at one point, things change. And then this is one of the ways social movements die when they uh, transform into civil wars. Uh, which, but if we take the case of Syria, for instance, uh, for six months was a non-violent movement in spite of the massacres in spite of 10,000 people being killed in these six months, and they were not responding with guns. Until at one point, Saudi Arabia, Qatar on the one hand, Iraq on the other hand, the United States intervening, the Soviet Union intervening, they organized a nice little geopolitically motivated civil war. So what? I mean, all these nice movements, and, all this, and then we are in such a crisis, the world is in terrible shape, and they are trying to reinvent democracy while people are starving, and so, so what? what? What these movements have actually produced? From the point of view of the movement, that is what the actors of the movement say, or at least part of the movement, say, well, if we start answering this question, we are falling in the trap of the productivist ideology of both capitalism and statism. What has happened every time is that the best intentioned movements end up in the hands of political bureaucrats or deviated by big corporations to increase their profits and increase their power over the people. Social movements are very romantic creatures. Social movements are destined to die. Uh, they are either they are crushed or they are uh, destined to win and then they are in institutionalized. They reform society by doing so and they are integrated and become part of a new system of management, which is not indifferent, can be real changes there. Let's say the women movement did change many things and is changing. The environmental movement did change many things and is changing. But then they become institutionalized and they stop being social movements to be parties, to be institutions, to be governments, etc., etc. The most lasting way for this particular type of movement is not what they do in the institution, it's what they do in the minds of the people. This movement, out of nothing, brought down and there's certain special circumstances with geopolitical forces intervene, etc. but they have brought down apparently unmovable dictatorships. These movements are playing a major political role 
in channeling discontent and deep disaffection in population at large, which cannot have their expression in the political system, and they are moving toward either possible um, desperation and violence, not let alone a wave of suicides, which is happening, but moving behind extreme right populist movement, nationalistic and xenophobic, which are becoming a major result of the Spanish, sorry, of the European crisis. Not so much in Spain because there is a strong movement, but in Finland, 20% for the true Finns. So bye bye the notion of the uh, tolerant, uh, nice uh, Finland with the first party in terms of voting intention in the last election being the true Finns, which are uh, truly right wing, or in uh, Greece with the rise of uh, Golden Dawn, uh, clearly neo Nazi party. And then finally, the, we are assisting to some experimentations in some countries, not by the movement, but by ideas, people issued from the movement that are even changing the landscape of politics in some countries. The most interesting one, of course, is Italy. How would you think about a party that uh, refuses the use of television, that decides to use exclusively internet and grassroots, huh? sounds familiar, um, and the program consists in, uh, among many other things, but consists in giving a minimum level of income to everybody simply for being a citizen, cutting 70% of the salaries of government officials and politicians and distributing this in microcredit for small companies, um, and uh, making sure that youth and, and women are fully represented in, in, the, in the parliament, uh, going out of the euro, of course, um, renegotiating the European Union, and the most important thing, dissolving the parliament and replacing the parliament by assemblies and deliberation and vote over the internet, starting with their own example, electing their candidates over the internet after the presentation in a YouTube video. Crazy, right? <laughs> Except that they became the number one party in Italy in the last election in terms of direct voting intention with 26% 20, uh, of the vote. But of course, the Italian law uh, has a great democratic rule that if any party in the, in the election to the Chamber of Deputies has one more vote, gets automatically absolute majority. Ha, how democratic. Uh, <laughs> the Senate is even more complicated because Berlusconi or, uh, organized a law that is called in Italy the pig law, for the obvious reason, um, in which is so complicated that ultimately if someone has a strong minority that Berlusconi hoped that he would lose the election, he would have it, could block the system. And that's exactly what happened. And now the system is blocked because the Five Star Movement and his leader, uh, Grillo, uh, are more or less blocking the, 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 the matter. Now, things are not so clear because, of course, a movement that is unstructured in that way has no discipline of vote. And so everybody is reacting with his, her consciousness and therefore, there's no way that they are going to have a unified position. And Grillo is extremely upset and is, tr is threatening to prosecute people, but he cannot because <laughs> there are no structures. Uh, so it's a mess. Yes, it's a mess. But pussy move. Uh, things move in, in that sense. There is a, a way in which the political class of Europe, which is terrified, terrified by the Grillo movement, starting to think, hmm, if we continue not to pay attention to any of this, one day we'll have some problems. Mm -hmm. And so what's happening is that these movements um, and what is surrounding them are uh, some of embryos or possibilities of new innovative forms of political representation that are brewing in the cauldron where projects of new politics are being brewed. We just hope, I hope personally, that when we taste the result of this brewing will be not be too bitter. Thank you for your attention.